Twitter and YouTube have upended the music industry's tried and true hit making machine. I'm Peter Latman reporting for Business Day Live. Ben Cesario will join me from the media desk to discuss the record business. And Jenna Wortham will look at how online dating services are using a low-tech approach to bring people together. But first, Best Buy reported its earnings yesterday, and the results highlighted the challenges that will face the company's new chief executive when he takes over next month. I'm joined by Michael De La Merced from DealBook, who has been following the company. Hi, Michael. Hey, Peter. So the continuing saga of Best Buy um, keeps going, and yesterday you covered the company's earnings, and it wasn't great news. Uh, I think that's putting it mildly. Um, its profit fell 91%, and pretty much by any metric of a retailer, it hasn't done well. Um, uh, same store stale sales in the U.S. went down, internationally they went down even more. Its cash position went down by 67%. It's just basically a really ugly situation that the company finds itself yeah, in. Yeah, and, and these grim earnings come at a time when a, when a few interesting things are happening with the company. So the company's founder is trying to take the company private and get private equity backing to do that. How's that going? Uh, so far, he's still trying to line up the financing. This deal could cost up to $8.8 billion, he says. But so far, he's trying to line up the partners, and right now, the company doesn't seem all that interested in it. They're trying to do their own turnaround program, so they've hired a new CEO to lead that. Um, and they're trying, they haven't revealed all the details of their plan, but they swear that they can uh, get things done and lift their fortunes up on their own. So it's interesting, as the company's stock price drops, will it make it easier for the company's founder to take it private because then he could line up cheaper financing? That's possible, and a lot of analysts seem to think that, yes, it could make it a little bit easier for him. But also does highlight the fact that Best Buy has a lot of issues that the company or the founder or whoever ends up running the company will have to face. Now, yesterday, another company that you followed for a very long time, Barnes & Noble, announced its earnings. And except for, I think, a sales boost from the erotica trilogy Fifty Shades of Grey, uh, the stock dropped because the results were not promising either. So here we have two companies, right? Best Buy, um, Circuit City came before it and has gone bankrupt. Barnes & Noble, Borders came before it, it's now gone. Are these companies in secular decline? Is this like Chinese water torture? Or do they stand a chance to survive? Well, that's the big question. Um, they are in a fight for survival. They are competing against the likes of Amazon. They're competing against Walmart. And so they're trying to figure out if they can actually carve out this niche for themselves where people will still go to these sort of specialized stores when you can just go online or you can find everything at a Walmart or a Costco. And so far, it's been pretty tough, and investors are a little wary of how these companies are going to survive. Thanks so much for coming on, Michael. Thanks, Peter. Online dating services work a lot like high-speed trading algorithms that sift through huge mounds of data looking for patterns. But singles are starting to question the utility of an online dating approach, which is why some services are taking a low-tech approach to introducing people. Jenna Wortham explains. I'm a nice person. I'm funny, I think. I, I could interact with a lot of people, but there are some people I'm not interested in interacting with, and all of them were on online dating, and they all found me. After one year of online dating, 27-year-old Kelly Bruce is giving up. Hi, are you here for the Meet My event? Yeah, yeah. Sort of. Great. So you have your drink ticket. Yes. Um, and then did you enter the promo coding correctly? Yeah, Brooklyn. Okay. Miss Bruce is at a singles event in Brooklyn, organized by Meet Moi, a mobile application that turns a cell phone into a matchmaker. After a quick download, Meet Moi uses GPS technology to track a user's location and send a notification if a potential match is nearby. Still, nothing beats a real-life get-together, so the company is hosting a party. I've been to Whistler before. Really? Yeah. Meet Moi connects people at the event based on mutual matching criteria. So people express their preferences and we put them together because they, ha they, sh they should be interested in each other. So this is, takes online like one step further and it goes from, oh, his picture's cute, to I see him across the room and I feel something. It's been th about three hours and I've met five girls so far. Um, been rather picky, I'll be honest. <laughs> You've already done the legwork to know that, okay, the people at this event are looking for the same things that I am, and they understand that you can pretty quickly just say yes or no, just like on the app. 
Other dating services have been getting in on offline matchmaking too. Match.com hosts STIR events, and OkCupid okay will hold more than 100 singles events this year alone. While OkCupid's okay online service is free, it does charge about $20 to attend a singles event, which also brings business to local bars. The parties also build online business. Events are great for us for getting new users and getting visibility. I came here today because I was walking by, it's one of my favorite bars, and I just went in to enjoy a drink and sit in the sit outside, do a little reading, do a little writing, and I saw they were having this event, so I decided to stick around because, you know what, it wouldn't hurt to try. We attract the kind of users that we really want when we throw events. We want the kind of user that doesn't want to sit in their bedroom behind a desktop computer to meet people. Meme-wa is used when people are out and about, so we want people with active social lives who are just looking to make those social lives better. When you're in person, you just have to be you. And it's so much more refreshing. It's so much more human. My phone's dead, though. I, the ironic part is I got here, and my phone had like 2%. Oh, well. <laughs> so if you do meet that person of your dreams, you might pick up the phone and give them a call, which, it just so happens, is the subject of the summer's big hit song. I wasn't looking for this, but now you're in my way. Your stare was holding, red jeans, skin was showing. That was Call Me Maybe by Carly Rae Jepsen. If ever a song has gone viral, it's that one. And it's changing the calculus for the music industry when it comes to churning out the hits. Ben Cesario joins me from the media desk. Hey, Ben. Good morning. Very cool story this morning, and it led to a great headline on the front page of the New York Times, the new rise of a summer hit, Tweet It Maybe. So the old formula, playing a song on the radio and it having become the big hit of the summer, that's changed with social media. Explain. Um, well, radio is still hugely important, especially in getting people to buy something. But a lot of times the big hit songs start on social media. Um, even just as recently as this year, I mean, last year, Katy Perry, Adele, Rihanna were the big songs. They're kind of conventional stars pushed by labels. This year, the big hits like Call Me Maybe, Somebody That I Used to Know by Gautier, uh, and uh, We're Young by Fun. Uh, they basically started in left field. They started in social media and they bubbled up and eventually were picked up by radio and by mainstream media. And this is really a function of how young people listen to music these days. I guess overwhelmingly they're YouTube going on to YouTube. YouTube is the most popular medium for teenagers to listen to music. Huh. So how does the music industry measure this, right? Traditionally, you would get airplay on the radio and you would be able to measure how many songs were being played and they you know rank the hits accordingly but how are they able to gauge now the success of a song based on tweets or YouTube you know YouTube views it seems like it's a whole new calculus there's a whole industry within an industry now of um, monitoring quantifying calculating analyzing social media all those tweets all those retweets all of the uh, you know parody videos and so forth they're, they're watched very closely. Um, they're watched by the labels, they're watched by a sort of industry uh, consultants, uh, and also the radio programmers, because you know, radio is a basically pretty conservative and risky world where you, know, you only have so many slots and they have to be hit songs. So the easiest way to find out if something's gonna be hit on radio now is just to look at YouTube. Right. And if something's big there, it's probably gonna be big on the radio. So. Um, YouTube is now basically the first stop huh. for marketing a song. And you dove into one song, Carly Rae Jepsen's Call Me Maybe, and you sort of tracked the evolution of a hit. And it really started with, you said, a Justin Bieber video that went viral. And then, of course, there was Sesame Street did a knockoff. The Harvard baseball team, team did a fantastic uh, video. H how did that evolve? Well, interestingly, the song started on radio. It was a minor hit in Canada where Carly Rae Jepsen is from. And then when, uh, when Justin Bieber heard it, he tweeted about it. He made this video with his friends. And that's what got, you know, that was the spark in the United States. Um, whether it, you know, whether Car Call Me Maybe would have become a hit here without that, I think it's pretty doubtful. So, um, you know, it was a sort of spark on Twitter and YouTube that just built and built and builds. 
Um, and of course, the great thing about these is that they can be aggregated and they can be, you know, linked to, and they build upon each other. And uh, you know, there's a there's a Tumblr feed of all of these things put together, and you can just spend endless hours watching people do the same moves of Call Me Maybe. Right. Um, and you know, it, aside from the fact that it's just a really catchy song, it's a fun phenomenon to watch it unfold, and I think that's part of what it is. It's just, it's, it's fun for people to reenact the video and make it their own. Yeah, and the New York Times website has a great interactive of, I think, the six or eight most popular videos that were spawned by Call Me Maybe, so you can go online and check that out. Please do. Thanks for coming on, Ben. Thank you. That's all for today. Please follow us at nytimes.com for our continuing coverage of these and other stories. I'm Peter Latman, reporting for Business Day Live. Thanks for watching. Thank you.